I'm Liam Ormark and I work with the Catholic Bishops' Conference of England and Wales Department of International Affairs and I was part of a delegation from the Catholic Bishops' Conference and Missio to Burma in July 2013. I'm Monsignor James Cronin and I'm the National Director of Missio and it was the second time a representative of Missio has visited Burma or Myanmar as it's now called and I went with the delegation, which was led by Bishop Declan Lang, who is chairman of the International Department and chairman of Missio. The first part of the delegation visit was to Rangoon, or Yangon as it's now known. We were there for several days, visiting the archdiocese there, meeting members of the democracy movement, representatives of the local church, before heading up to Kachin State, which is about a three-hour flight north of Yangon on one of Burma's internal airlines. Kachin State is the northernmost part of Burma on the border with China, and it's home to the Kachin people, who are one of Burma's largest ethnic nationalities. The Kachin are distinct from the country's majority Burman population. They have their own language, their own culture, and the vast majority are Christian, between 80 and 90 percent of the Kachin people are Christian, compared to around 1% throughout the whole country. Conflict broke out in Kachin state shortly after Burma became independent. The Burmese government tried to impose a very nationalistic Burman and Buddhist regime across the whole country without much tolerance for other ethnic groups. The rebel Kachin Independence Army was formed then to defend the Kachin identity and to fight for the Kachin people to run their own affairs. The Catholic Church in Kachin State has a long history of supporting the rights of the Kachin people and standing up against oppression and abuses by the successive military dictatorships that have ruled Burma. Today the Church continues to play a significant role in political dialogue particularly through the Bishop of Michener, Francis Dortang, who hosted the Catholic Bishops' Conference and Missio delegation. The current situation in Kachin State is quite different to many of Burma's other ethnic regions. When a new government took control of Burma in 2010, things began to improve in several areas. Ceasefires have been signed with rebel groups and there's been more open discussion about the rights of ethnic nationalities. But in Kachin State, things actually took a step backwards. In 2011, the government broke a ceasefire with the Kachin Independence Army in a dispute over the control of natural resources and began launching heavy attacks against the rebels for the first time since the mid-1990s. So the Kachin people now had more than two years of troop surges, airstrikes and human rights violations that many international observers recognise as war crimes. And there's been a massive civilian cost to this. Over 100,000 people have been driven out of their homes and are now living in internally displaced persons camps. We spent several days visiting these camps during our time in Katrin State. Yes, Lim, I remember that very well. In fact, a lot of those camps, of course, are run by the Christian churches. And Christianity in the Kachin states divides between the Baptist congregations and the Catholic diocese. And they're both working closely together to support the internally displaced people who in many cases, of course, have fled hundreds of miles after their villages were attacked. This is one of the camps that is very near the main cathedral, St Columbus Cathedral, the main Catholic cathedral in the state of Michina. It's one of the smaller camps, but there are still more than 100 families, and of course that equates to about 400 people, over whom half are under 12. And we actually met some children who'd been born in the camps and had spent their entire life so far in those camps. Well, you can see the kind of conditions people are living in. There's overcrowding with a whole family sharing just one single room in a very basic wooden shelter. Sanitation is not good either because there is so little space and latrines are very close to where people are sleeping and cooking. So especially when we were there during the monsoon season when the camps are flooding, there is serious sickness outbreaks. I think there was one of the highest levels of dengue fever whilst we were there. The church is using its land for providing food and buildings and more shelters, but there is obviously a real strain on their resources. As of late 2013, there was a lull in the fighting and peace talks are taking place. 
there are still actually more displaced people arriving. This is because a lot of them went to relatives in the first instance, but now those relatives can no longer support them, so they've come into the camps. I think one of the most tragic things is that a lot of these families have nothing to go back to. Their villages have been destroyed, and in many cases their livestock have been killed. Sometimes the troops, well, they've broken down their homes for materials to build outposts, and there's been a lot of landmines laid. Burma is one of the most heavily mined countries in Asia. So even though there are many peace talks underway at the moment, families are still stuck in the camps. Many of them have already been there for two years or more, and it will be several years before they can leave, even if the fighting were to stop tomorrow. The biggest camp in Michna actually has around 3,000 people still there. This is actually two camps joined together. One is run by the Catholic Church and one is run by the Kachin Baptist Convention and they're working together to support these people. And around half of those people in the camps are children. In addition to the health problems, one of the biggest challenges facing the children in the camps is disruption to their education. The government is supposed to be making provision in local schools for children who've been displaced by the fighting, but in reality this isn't happening. That's something we saw while we were there. The schools are already full, so children from the camps can only go for a few days each week, and in many cases they have to stand at the back of the classroom, and that's obviously ruining their education and is likely to have an effect on them for a long, long time after the conflict is over. So the church has organised classes in the camp to help with this. You can see here one of the makeshift classrooms that provides some extra education for children on days that they can't go to school. Particularly in these bigger camps, there is some support from international NGOs and from foreign governments. But whilst they help to an extent with food and shelter, there's still a shortfall and there certainly isn't enough provision to cover other things that families need, like clothes or even cooking oil and cooking materials. So we've reached a stage now where a lot of people have exhausted their own resources. They've spent any money that they brought with them, they've sold any jewellery that they brought with them, and in an increasing number of cases, they're now in debt to local moneylenders. So they have no source of income, even if they can get home, because they've lost their crops and their animals in the conflict. So it really is a desperate situation right now, and the church is on the front line, literally keeping people alive. And the church is under enormous pressure as a result of this conflict, but nevertheless it's flourishing and actively developing. There is a a minor seminary attached to St Columban's Cathedral. It was established some 30 years ago by Irish priests and today have around about 80 students. As well as the spiritual formation of the young lads, it also plays a very important role in their education because, you see, the church is not allowed to run its own schools so the seminary provides some accommodation so that they can attend the state schools. It also provides remedial education in the evenings to improve their skills and also their knowledge base. Roughly a quarter of the boys here will go to the major seminaries and train to be priests, but the others will follow different paths, but with a better start in life than they would otherwise have been available to them. There is also a very active community of sisters, the Sisters of St Francis Xavier, including many young novices, and the nuns are involved in catechesis, strengthening the church throughout the state. The current construction of an extension to their monastery is testimony to the size of their developing community. Whilst we were there, we visited a number of other church-run projects, which, whilst we were in Michina, included a HIV AIDS clinic, which supports about 60 people at any one time. The patients there come from all around Kachin State and from very different faith backgrounds. The sisters actually recruit people with HIV to run the clinic, providing them with employment and the opportunity to help others with the disease. More broadly, the church is responsible for significant health care provision, and on our last day in Michener, Bishop Francis took us to a brand new clinic that the diocese has just built. Nearby, the church also runs an orphanage for over 100 children aged from 4 right up to 20, This was set up in the 1990s as an alternative to the state-run orphanages, which was doing the bare minimum for the children without any particular, well, compassion or focus on their development. Again, the impact of the conflict is very clear here. A lot of these children have lost parents in fighting. Some may have joined the rebel forces. Others would have been killed when their villages were attacked by the government troops. 
It's still too early to tell whether the common peace initiatives in Katrin State will succeed, but either way, the people still have many hard years ahead. There were 100,000 people in the camps, many with nowhere to go back to. There were villages that have been completely decimated. There were children who've lost parents, and there were other children who are being deprived of their whole childhood. But the church is paving the way for a better future. And Bishop Francis Dortang is a key leader in this. His commitment to his people through involvement in the peace talks, humanitarian work, social projects, and even initiatives to protect the environment are absolutely inspirational. It is amazing that in the face of such adversity, with so many challenges, the Catholic Church in Katrin State is still looking forward and finding new ways to help the people. And we have a duty to support them in this, however we can.